About 15 minutes later, we came to a place where the snowbank on the right of the road wasn't so high because the plows are supposed to raise their blades a little when they go through an intersection. This looks like where we turned, Lumley said, not sounding too sure about it. I don't see the sign. This is it, Toki answered. He didn't sound like himself at all. You can just see the top of the signpost. Oh, sure. Lumley sounded relieved. Listen, Mr. Tooklander, I'm sorry about being so short back there. I was cold and worried and calling myself 200 kinds of fool. And I want to thank you both. Don't thank Booth and me until we've got them in this car, Tookie said. He put the scout in four-wheel drive and slammed his way through the snowbank and on to Jointner Avenue, which goes through the lot and out to 295. Snow flew up from the mud guards. The rear end tried to break a little bit, but Tookie's been driving through snow since Hector was a pup. He jockeyed it a bit, talked to it, and on we went. The headlights picked out the bare indication of other tire tracks from time to time, the ones made by Lumley's car, and then they would disappear again. Lumley was leading forward, looking for his car. And all at once, Tookie said, Mr. Lumley? What? He turned around at Tookie. People around these parts are... Kind of superstitious about Salem's lot, Tookie says, sounding easy enough, but I could see the deep lines of strain around his mouth and the way his eyes kept moving from side to side. If your people are in the car, why, that's fine. We'll pack them up, go back to my place, and tomorrow, when the storm's over, Billy will be glad to yank your car out of the snowbank. But if they're not in the car, not in the car... Lumley broke in sharply. Why wouldn't they be in the car? If they're not in the car, Tookie goes on, not answering, we're going to turn around and drive back to Falmouth Center and whistle for the sheriff. Makes no sense to go wallowing around at night in a snowstorm anyway, does it? They'll be in the car? Where else would they be? I said, uh, one other thing, Mr. Lumley, if we should see anybody, we're not going to talk to them, not even if they talk to us. You understand that? Very slow, Lumley says. Just what are these superstitions? But before I could say anything, God alone knows what I would have said, Tookie broke in. We're there. We were coming up on the back end of a big Mercedes. The whole hood of the thing was buried in a snowdrift, and another drift had socked in the whole left side of the car. But the taillights were on, and we could see exhaust drifting out of the tailpipe. They didn't run out of gas anyway, Lumley said. Tookie pulled up and pulled on the scout's emergency brake. You remember what Booth told you, Lumley? Sure, sure. But he wasn't thinking of anything but his wife and daughter... I don't see how anybody could blame him either. Ready, Booth? Tookie asked me. His eyes held on mine, grim and gray in the dashboard lights. I guess I am, I said. We all got out and the wind grabbed us, throwing snow in our faces. Lumley was first, bending into the wind, his fancy topcoat billowing out behind him like a sail. He cast two shadows. One from Tookie's headlights, the other from his own taillights. I was behind him, and Tookie was a step behind me. When I got to the trunk of the Mercedes, Tookie grabbed me. Let him go, he said. Janie! Francie! Lumley yelled. Everything okay? He pulled open the driver's side door and leaned in. Everything! He froze to a dead stop. The wind ripped the heavy door right out of his hand and pushed it all the way open. Holy God, Booth, Tookie said, just below the scream of the wind. I think it's happened again. Lumley turned back towards us. His face was scared and bewildered, his eyes wide. All of a sudden he lunged towards us through the snow, slipping and almost falling. 
He brushed me away like I was nothing and grabbed Tookie. How did you know? He roared. Where are they? What the hell is going on here? Tookie broke his grip and shoved past him. He and I looked into the Mercedes together. Warm as toast it was, but it wasn't going to be for much longer. The little amber low fuel light was glowing. The big car was empty. There was a child's Barbie doll on the passenger's floor mat, and a child's ski parka was crumpled over the seat back. Tookie put his hands over his face, and then he was gone. Lumley had grabbed him and shoved him right back into the snowbank. His face was pale and wild. His mouth was working as if he had chewed down on some bitter stuff he couldn't yet unpucker enough to spit out. He reached in and grabbed the parka. Francie's coat, he kind of whispered, and then loud, bellowing, Francie's coat. He turned around, holding it in front of him by the little fur-trimmed hood. He looked at me, blank and unbelieving. She can't be out without her coat on, Mr. Booth. Why, why, she'll freeze to death. Mr. Lumley, he blundered past me, still holding the parka, shouting, Francie! Janie, where are you? Where are you? I gave Tookie my hand and pulled him onto his feet. Are you all? Never mind me, he says. We've got to get hold of him, Booth. We went after him as fast as we could, which wasn't very fast, with the snow hip deep in some places. But then he stopped, and we caught up to him. Mr. Lumley, Tookie started, laying a hand on his shoulder. This way, Lumley said. This is the way they went. Look. We looked down. We were in a kind of dip here, and most of the wind went right over our heads. And you could see two sets of tracks, one large and one small, just filling up with snow. If we had been five minutes later, they would have been gone. He started to walk away, his head down, and Tookie grabbed him back. No, no, Lumley. Lumley turned his wild face up to Tookie's and made a fist. He drew it back, but something in Tookie's face made him falter. He looked from Tookie to me and then back again. She'll freeze, he said, as if we were a couple of stupid kids. Don't you get it? She doesn't have her jacket on, and she's only seven years old. He could be anywhere, Tookie said. You can't follow those tracks. They'll be gone in the next drift. What do you suggest? Lumley yells, his voice high and hysterical. If we go back to get the police, she'll freeze to death. Francie and my wife. They may be frozen already, Tookie said. His eyes caught Lumley's. Frozen or something worse. What do you mean? Lumley whispered. Get it straight, God damn it! Tell me. Mr. Lumley, Tookie says, there's something in the lock. But I was the one who came out with it finally, said the word I never expected to say. Vampires, Mr. Lumley. Jerusalem's lock is full of vampires. I expect that's hard for you to swallow. He was staring at me as if I'd gone green. Loonies, he whispered. You're a couple of loonies. Then he turned away, cupped his hands around his mouth, and bellowed, Francie! Janie! He started floundering off again. The snow was up to the hem of his fancy coat. I looked at Tookie. What do we do now? Follow him, Tookie says. His hair was plastered with snow, and he did look a little bit loony. I just can't leave him out here, Booth. Can you? No, I says, guess not. So we started to wade through the snow after Lumley as best we could, but he kept getting further and further ahead. He had his youth to spend, you see. He was breaking the trail, going through that snow like a bull. Oh, my arthritis began to bother me something terrible, and I started to look down at my legs, telling myself, a little further, just a little further, keep going, damn it, keep going. I piled right into Tookie, who was standing spread-legged in the drift. His head was hanging, and both of his hands were pressed to his chest. Tookie, I says, you okay? I'm all right, he said, 
taking his hands away. We'll stick with him, Booth, and when he fags out, he'll see reason. We topped a rise, and there was Lumley at the bottom, looking desperately for more tracks. Poor man, there wasn't a chance he was going to find them. The wind blew straight across down there where he was, and any tracks would have been rubbed out three minutes after they was made, let alone a couple of hours. He raised his head and screamed into the night, Francie, Janie, for God's sake. And you could hear the desperation in his voice, the terror and pity for it. The only answer he got back was the freight train wail of the wind. It almost seemed to be laughing at him, saying, I took the Mr. New Jersey with your fancy car and camel's hair top coat. I took them and I rubbed out their tracks, and by morning I'll have them just as neat and frozen as two strawberries in a deep freeze. Lumley, took he bawled over the wind. Listen, you never mind vampires or boogies or nothing like that, but you mind this. You're just making it worse for them. We've got to get... And there was an answer. A voice coming out of the dark like little tinkling silver bells, and my heart turned cold as ice in a cistern. Jerry, Jerry, is that you? Lumley wheeled at the sound, and then she came, drifting out of the dark shadows of a little copse of trees like a ghost. She was a city woman, all right, Right then she seemed like the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. I felt like I wanted to go to her and tell her how glad I was she was safe after all. She was wearing a heavy green pullover sort of thing, a, a poncho, I believe they're called. It floated all around her, and her dark hair streamed out in the wild wind like water in a September creek just before the winter freeze stills it and locks it in. Maybe I did take a step towards her because I felt Tookie's hand on my shoulder rough and warm. And still, how can I say it? I yearned after her, so dark and beautiful with that green poncho floating around her neck and shoulders as exotic and strange as to make you think of some beautiful woman from a Walter Della Mayer poem. Janie, Lumley cried, Janie! He began to struggle through the snow towards her, his arms outstretched. No, Tucky cried. No, Lumley. He never even looked. But she did. She looked up at us and grinned. And when she did, I felt my longing, my yearning, turn to horror as cold as the grave, as white and silent as bones in a shroud. Even from the rise, we could see the sullen red glare in those eyes. They were less human than a wolf's eyes. And when she grinned, you could see how long her teeth had become. She wasn't human anymore. She was a dead thing, somehow come back to life in this black howling storm. Tookie made the sign of the cross at her. She flinched back and then grinned at us again. We were too far away, or maybe too scared. Stop it, I whispered. Can't we stop it? Too late, Booth, Tookie says grimly. Lumley had reached her. He looked like a ghost himself, coated in snow like he was. He reached for her, and then he began to scream. I'll hear that sound in my dreams, that man screaming like a child in a nightmare. He tried to back away from her, but her arms, long and bare and as white as the snow, snaked out and pulled him to her. I could see her cock her head, and then thrust it forward. Booth, Tookie said hoarsely, we've got to get out of here. And so we ran. Ran like rats, I suppose some would say, but those who would weren't there that night. We fled back down along our own back trail, falling down, getting up again, slipping and sliding. I kept looking back over my shoulder to see if that woman was coming after us, 
grinning that grin and watching us with those red eyes. We got back to the scout and Tookie doubled over, holding his chest. Tookie, I said, badly scared. What? Ticker, he said. Been bad for five years or more. Get me around in the shotgun seat booth and then get us the hell out of here. I hooked an arm under his coat and dragged him around and somehow boosted him up and in. He leaned his head back and shut his eyes. His skin was waxy looking and yellow. I went back around the hood of the truck at a trot and I damn near ran into the little girl. She was just standing there beside the driver's side door, her hair and pigtails wearing nothing but a little bit of a yellow dress. Mister, she said in a high, clear voice as sweet as morning mist, won't you help me find my mother? She's gone and I'm so cold. Honey, I said, honey, you better get in the truck. Your mother... I broke off. And if there was ever a time in my life I was close to swooning, that was the moment. She was standing there, you see, but she was standing on top of the snow and there were no tracks, not in any direction. She looked up at me then, Lumley's daughter, Francie. She was no more than seven years old, and she was going to be seven for an eternity of nights. Her little face was a ghastly corpse white, her eyes a red and silver that you could fall into. And below her jaw, I could see two small punctures like pinpricks, their edges horribly mangled. She held out her arms at me and smiled. Pick me up, mister, she said softly. I want to give you a kiss. Then you can take me to my mommy. I didn't want to, but there was nothing I could do. I was leaning forward, my arms outstretched. I could see her mouth opening. I could see the little fangs inside the pink ring of her lips. Something slipped down her chin, bright and silvery, and with a dim, distant, faraway horror, I realized she was drooling. Her small hands clasped themselves around my neck, and I was thinking, well, maybe it won't be so bad. Not so bad. Maybe it won't be so awful after a while. Then something black flew out of the scout and struck her on the chest. There was a puff of strange-smelling smoke, a flashing glow that was gone an instant later. And then she was backing away, hissing. Her face was twisted into a vulpine mask of rage and hate and pain. She turned sideways, and then... And then she was gone. One moment she was there, and the next there was a twisting knot of snow that looked a little bit like a human shape. Then the wind tattered it away across the fields. Booth, Tookie whispered. Be quick now. And I was, but not so quick that I didn't have time to pick up what he had thrown at that little girl from hell, his mother's Douay Bible. Uh, that was some time ago. I'm a sight older now, and I was no chicken then. Herb took Lander, passed on two years ago. He went peaceful in the night. The bar's still there. Some man and his wife from Waterville bought it. Nice people, and they've kept it pretty much the same. But I don't go by much. It's different somehow with Tookie gone. Things in the lot go on pretty much as they always have. Well, the sheriff found that fellow Lumley's car the next day. Out of gas, battery dead. Neither Tookie nor I said anything about it. What would have been the point? And every now and then a hitchhiker or a camper will disappear around there someplace, up on Schoolyard Hill or out near the Harmony Hill Cemetery. They'll turn up the fellow's pack sack or a paperback book all swollen and bleached out by the rain or snow or some such. But never the people. I still have bad dreams about that stormy night we went out there. Not about the woman so much as the little girl, and the way she smiled when she held her arms up so that I could pick her up, so she could give me a kiss. 
But I'm an old man now, and the time comes soon when dreams are done. You may have an occasion to be traveling in southern Maine yourself one of these days. Pretty part of the countryside. You may even stop by Tookie's Bar for a drink. Nice place. Uh, they kept the name just the same. So, have your drink. And then my advice to you is to keep right on moving north. Whatever you do, don't go up that road to Jerusalem's lot. Especially not after dark. There's a little girl somewhere out there, and I think she's still waiting for her good night kiss. <laughs>